as Lee said, this is drawing the bits together effectively, and we do want to feel that we're part of an ongoing flux. So to invite the group from Huddersfield was absolutely it came up in the conversation we had, I think, in Cambridge, was it might well before then, the idea of uh, collaboration, especially with AHRC work, is now extremely important. And the way you carry things forward is to communicate with other people, to share things. And we will, at the end of the day, or possibly at lunchtime, be having a technical discussion to ensure that we have compatibility in the formats between Pierre's programming and Frederic's programming so that we can share things in an ongoing uh, development. And that's extremely important to make sure that this happens. So we are very much now into collaborative work between institutions and in due course, I'm sure, across uh, Europe as well. So today and my paper will do very little in terms of original things. Most of the points I'm going to make probably have cropped up in the three symposia. We had a management steering committee meeting yesterday, and one of our external readers commended the way that we had built the three symposia and developed on the previous symposia, taking them forward. And that will emerge, I hope, today as one of our themes. We have changed our views over the three years. We've got to grips with our subject. Uh, but there are one or two strands that were always there. And the first one is, second point here, listener focus. We essentially want our tools to be to do with the listening experience, the experience of the music. Those were the points that we actually put to the AHRC very early on. And actually, they've stuck. They've absolutely been what we've, we've really uh, grasped onto. Intended to address a wide range of genres and categories. We hope, when you see the book contents, and I'm uh, happy to say that's with CUP at the moment being read, as I'll say a bit more in a minute. And it's intended to bring together existing research. We've certainly done that. Mike will be actually talking a lot about that in his uh, work as well. And that final bullet point is this afternoon, of course, when Pierre shows you the latest beta version of the e-analysis software. And it's really got some wonderful new features since the workshop of the uh, symposia last year. We saw it evolve over the workshops. It's now reaching um, a wonderful kind of, uh, well, it will never conclude. We hope Pierre will carry on developing it, but it's reaching now a stage of quite a good mature program. That was uh, a summary of our research methods. Lee has written a lot about uh, the idea of, the, of getting tools together, and uh, we really thought that we had a fragmented world. In other words, there was a lot of writing about analysis, but actually, in truth, very little analysis. In other words, it appears that over the years, people have written about how to analyze things. they designed vocabularies to analyze things, but they've never actually taken works apart and tried to come to terms with them. There are wonderful exceptions, of course, from Stefan Roy and uh, Simone and other uh, publications. And more recently, Michael's own work has begun really to come to grips with analysis of our field. Of course, we have the perennial problem of representation, which will uh, never go away. Our subject is, of course, uh, usually not written down in traditional notation. Of course, I'll uh, make one or two exceptions to that when we come to mixed music and music that involves instruments. But by and large, we have to represent it somehow if you want to get to grips with it. We're very interested, too, in finding more about comparative evaluation, that is, well, some kinds of tool will be better than others, but perhaps there are gaps which we need to fill in, and that is one of the things we've been trying to do. Perhaps not necessarily succeeding in three years, but what we hope our project has done is assemble the tools, making it much clearer to the community when the book has come out what the future might hold in our area. And software development, uh, Pierre will be talking about. Lee early on in the discussion said, well, we have to address basically four kinds of questions, four-part question. For which users, in other words, how we approach our subject, it does depend who it's for. And I'll be mentioning uh, uh, Lee's analysis and playing a short clip of his look at uh, Trevor Wishart's work, Encounters in the Republic of Heaven, in which 
he's wanting to develop the use in schools and explaining to relatively younger people how the music works in a way. So for which users will then define how it's represented, the kinds of tools you need to do that. For which works and genres, I'll just show you a couple of slides that I think I included in the last symposium last year, in which the actual stuff of the music screams at you differently from the slide show. In other words, the actual representation is radically different depending on the kind of genre music you are looking at. With what intentions? Well, as I said, it might be to younger people. It might be to show the form of a work. I'll show a couple of illustrations of that in a moment. It might be to go into the micro detail of a work. All of those things will determine the fourth bullet point with which tools. So those interact, and you can't put them in a sequence. If you think about it, all four of those parts of the analytical question interact with each other. So we've got a kind of cauldron of bubbling things which interact with each other. Uh, this is one of Lee's slides, uh, with permission. He created uh, these slides for our EMS talk, uh, EMS network talk last year, and for which users, actually that's just what I was summarizing a second ago, which tools, for example, do you want to use a kind of Schaeferian theory, or Stéphane Bois, uh, Grille Fonctionnel, or um, spatiomorphology, and of course spatiomorphology pertains to space, so that will only be relevant if you're interested in that kind of, of approach. Um, and Lee zone something to hold on to, and so on. So this is going to be a toolbox, which Mike's been doing a lot of work on, which brings together all of these possibilities such that you might pick and choose and add and subtract according to your needs when you're looking at a piece. Uh, what intentions, that's uh, a list from one of Lee's articles as well. What kinds of issues, that was a preliminary list, others have come up. Uh, our contributors have stressed meaning and affect and emotion a lot more as the work has progressed over the three years. So our very first symposium, I remember at least two contributors saying, we need to know what music means. We need to know more about how it's, it affects you. What is the result of the music, not just its mechanics and how it's put together. Tricky issues, quite difficult, and not, uh, no simple answers to that. So the genres question, that's um, one of the slides uh, I used at the same talk. EARS lists 81 genres and categories, and we're sure more will have been developed in recent years. A genre is a musical or artistic grouping, according to the EARS site. So for example, soundscape or acousmatic might be thought of as a genre, whereas a category is grouped around a performance situation or an aspect of technology. So installation is not a genre, it's a category. It's a kind of approach to the technology or microsound or algorithmic. And uh, we'll see how that pans out in a minute when I get round to the book, which will be a major output of this project. Um, one of the key things about genre and category is it's very difficult for us as analysts to make what the ethnomusicologists call emic or etic distinct distinctions. If you don't know your emic etic distinction, I'll remind you that it comes from the word phonemic and phonetic. Phonetic distinctions are ones we can measure, Phonemic distinctions are ones that are important, which are, which are decided by the social culture itself. So, as I spoke in uh, Greece about this project just a couple of weeks ago in Corfu, I said, well, in the north of England, uh, where my family are from, half of my family say bark, pass, and grass, the southern half of my family, and the northern half say back, pass, and grass. To an English-speaking English person, that is a phonemic distinction. But when I was in Korea giving a talk and they couldn't understand my English because they had learned American English, <laughs> it was a phonetic distinction and it was not comprehensible that I could switch from saying bath to bath and it was the same word, different word to somebody from outside the English language area, let alone bath. <laughs> so. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> So, we've got to represent two kinds of distinctions in what we do, the etic and the emic. 
The ETIC is just simply produced for us by the terrific software packages we now have, Piers and others of course, can give us the ETIC distinctions very quickly. It can't give us the EMIC distinctions. What is a significant aspect of what we do? And that is a symbiotic relationship. The literature has words such as parameters or variables or qualities or attributes or properties or features. All of those mean roughly the same thing. And I suggest actually the future will lie with us using a sort of meta-tagging system where we can reconfigure what it is that makes a salient property or quality something that makes an emic distinction between one uh, particular part of a work and another, for example. So, that's going to be a very important thing. How we handle the information, we can get etic distinctions with software extremely quickly, but not so easily can we make emic distinctions. Okay, I'm not giving you actually a lecture on uh, phonetics and phonemics today, really. But I want to move on to what the project is outputting. Um, these will be presented to you at much greater length in a few moments' time and this afternoon. Uh, I want to just uh, thank both of those contributors, Mike Gap, Pierre Coupri, they core members of our team. Mike's Orima website was not predicted as part of the application to the AHRC, which is what makes it such a fantastic uh, innovation. Mike came up with this idea in the very first year of his doctoral studies with the project, and uh, you will hear a lot more about it in a moment, and of course, many of you in this room have already contributed to it. Mike will tell us more about that. But the idea that a community can look at a work rather than an individual superstar or an individual ego is, I think, a really important point. It's making the point that we share things and develop a community and one of the themes that we did put to the AHRC was the idea that we do have a strong community in the UK and throughout the world through such as EMS Network, which is beginning now to form a, a, um, a coherent, I think is the best word, a coherent network of people thinking about the subject, composers and analysts, musicologists working together to create a community of interest. So sharing is the key thing there. Mike will develop that in due course. Not so much individuated anymore. Pierre's work uh, will be looked at this afternoon. Every single forum that we've had in the last three years has had an update on the uh, e-analysis project. I want to stress in this little preliminary that we have tried as a team to integrate across. And Orimo was the new kid on the block, but linking to Lee and my thoughts so that, as you will see, some of the menus in uh, Pierre's systems actually take on board the toolbox that uh, Mike has been getting together, that I and Lee and others have been writing about so extensively. So the whole thing becomes a kind of symbiotic relationship in which the toolbox feeds into the analysis, and then we can begin thinking about the emic etic distinctions within the work, how works actually come together. Um, through the three research uh, forums and many, many other discussions that we've had over the three years. It's still three months to run, it's not quite three years yet. Um, I've got together some of the analyses that we've uh, done uh, just to give you an illustration of the different genres, different techniques, um, different um, styles, really. Uh, this was one that I was experimenting myself with the fraught question, should we actually represent sounds with uh, icons of what they are? And I concluded that, in fact, with the new acousmatic music, which has been do certainly dominant in the UK since the 1990s, where recognisable sounds are intended to be recognisable, the idea of mapping real-world images, which are a bit vague there, but balloons and cicadas, onto ideas of in-breath, out-breath, systole, diastole, where in fact whoops, lost the word air, which I have. So 
I naturally played that in Corfu where I was reminded that uh, my Greek audience could tell me what time of year it was that those were recorded and what time of day that there's a lot more <laughs> indicated within sound. That's a, it's a very interesting point. So that for somebody emically within the culture, it isn't just stridulation. It's noon in the summer. It has extra significance because of this extra uh, cultural knowledge which that brings to the situation. So, there are many different kinds, and this is of course all using the analysis software, and I just want to illustrate to you the range of questions that uh, this can bring you. This slide, I haven't actually ever said this to Lee, um, over the years, both of us, individually and together, have been quite critical of that school of thought that says that spectrograms can actually give you lots of information about the sound, because it is clear that a spectrogram tells you something about the listening experience, but you can't necessarily deduce from a spectrogram what a sound sounds like. But I have to say that this a spectrogram I found stunningly helpful in making me come to terms with a genre known as glitch. And I think that it is, it's, it's, uh, here it is, uh, there we are, CNC2. Both the time domain and the frequency domain. I found the spectrogram quite re revelatory when I first looked at it compared with the time domain representation. And uh, I think it reveals quite a lot about <coughs> the nature of the sound. Um, this one, I love this spectrogram. All I was wanting to do was to look at the total form of a piece. And I thought, well, Kitts Beach Soundwalk, I'm going to choose the green and blue option in uh, Pierre's colour schemes uh, for sort of symbolic reasons. It's both by CM, and it's about green issues. But in fact, I found that extraordinarily poetic because uh, you know the piece well. Hildegard introduces us to the filtering, and she removes the city in this wonderfully poetic cave at the bottom of the spectrum. That is the entire work, and you can, um, uh, well, here it is in the... Uh, let's just go and say... Pretend we are somewhere far away. And then you enter this strange world where, seeing the total form, you also enter this region where there's tons of middle These are the tiny, the intimate voices She's entering of the nature, barnacles world. You know the of body, well, sure. of dream, of the imagination. And that's the first set of dreams. And this is very clear how the second set of dreams, which introduces to a strangely uh, high-pass filtered versions of Xenakis, and Mozart actually have very different spectral contents, which it draws You're attention still to. Hearing Change my listening of the piece to see the spectrum. And spectrum. already, they're changing. So, that is the total piece, and I think it expresses a huge amount, helps us listen to it, and the way that Hildegard Westerkamp has structured that music. This is where Pierre's ability to uh, bring in uh, other graphical information is extremely important because I won't desert instruments. Those of you who know me know that I uh, work a lot with instrumentalists and I've always wanted the ability to compare uh, sounds which are notated with sounds from what you might call the actual. <laughs> to all 
also with permission, I haven't got it from Xenia Festival yet, but on Hans Tuchka's website, the video, it, that this is indeed her playing. I want to correlate the score with her gestures with the sound world to create a kind of three-way relationship between uh, the three worlds of the sight mm -hmm. image, the score image, and the sound image. In my chapter in the book, I try to undermine the traditional musicological approach, which is to start with Hans's very beautiful and very well laid out score. I bring that in last. The first experience is attempting to come to terms with the piece purely as if heard from a concert from the first time with nothing in front of me, slowly building up a picture of the piece until in the very last bit of the analysis I bring in the score and see if that correlates with what my listening has been. So I, even when using a score world, I want to do it, as it were, in reverse. Well, just to check the order of my slides here. Yes, that was the next one. Good. Lee, is, as I said to you earlier, has been uh, transcribing uh, a section of Trevor Wishart's Encounters in the Republic of Heaven. And Lee could say a lot more about this, and will do so in his chapter when we come to read it. But Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had to fall. I don't know, I don't. Old Kim Horses, old Kim Men, trying to put up teeth together again. You know what it was? <laughs> came back from holiday and on the second day on the next morning one of the big hamsters had ate one of the babies so both of them had to go away like the trouble is of course I start listening to the music and get carried away <laughs> <laughs> who couldn't yes. Good. Good so um, that's five examples of e-analysis assisting an analysis in some way and we want the largest possible community to try out these things both for our benefit as members of the community and also in the ongoing discussions how to develop these tools and what additional tools are needed and how that would help us. I, uh, we will discuss at the end of the day one of the possibilities. I spoke with some <coughs> colleagues uh, and a uh, proposal that Wei Wei has to, to work with um, people from neuroscience area. Maybe we will have a, a version of this where we'll track the brain information while somebody's listening to music. And then we can actually have various kinds of uh, affective result of the listening experience encoded at the same time to see the relationship between the sound and some of the neurological uh, things that are happening to us when we listen. Okay, I'll carry on for three or four more minutes and then we can have any discussion points. One of the major outputs in addition to the software will be our book. We. Uh, developed this over the course of the symposium year. Those of you who came to the first symposium that Michael was the, we called him the non-keynote because we just invited him to observe and comment and gave us some great feedback on that, was the number of genres and categories that we covered. We really have tried to expand that and to include them all in the book in one way or another. So our book has three parts. Um, the first one is just a long chapter by uh, Lee and myself on the genres and categories and what they need. So it basically summarizes what we're saying now, the energetic distinction, questions we need to ask, the kinds of tools we need, drawing together what has been done. But I think that the second group, that's the first one, the second one, there is the second part, which is essentially an ideas part of the book. Those chapters are in, they're with CUP readers at the moment, cross your fingers that uh, the readers uh, will approve it and we'll go to contract in the autumn, I hope. But I want to stress that we've managed to include chapters that challenge some of the ideas that are around at the moment. Gary Kendall, Listening and Meaning, he's trying to go beyond what he has criticised as the era of the sound object 
and I think he's pushing us towards the era of the sound event, away from objects towards events. Events exist in time. Exert events are prepared. Events have consequences, which objects don't necessarily have. So Gary is trying to shift the language on a bit. John Young, our own John Young from this department, is looking at the bigger picture. He and Raoul Minsberg in the final part there really feel that form has not been addressed in our subject, that there's very little discussed on how the work, the piece, if indeed the piece exists. So there are open forms, of course. There are forms which don't start, don't strictly have beginnings and endings, they just start and stop in Stockhausen's terminology. Moment forms, different kinds of forms. So we have two authors looking at form there. Michael Young uh, has written a very provocative chapter, if you know Michael's work on um, um, generative music. He's trying to put forward an idea that generative music actually is rather a special case. It causes real problems for the analyst because the degree to which you know the generative procedure affects very much how you are perceiving the work. Uh, Tae Hong Park, some of you know that he's in the computational area. Uh, we have not stressed computational aspects of this project and we wanted a contribution to look at. He has developed uh, a more computational, machine-oriented view. We have, as one of our background philosophies, a human listening-oriented point of view. We've not done much work on machines. Tehong will include this, we'll include Tehong's chapter to try and bridge this gap. Maybe future research projects will be more um, machine-oriented. We shall see. And of course we have Mike on Orma and the idea of an analytical community and how that has developed and what that he feels are its most important and salient features. Simon, there's also Pierre's chapter. It's on the next slide. It's oh. special. Oh, I see. Excuse me. Uh, the, this is what's going to CUP already. This is with CUP slides. These are the actual analyses that have been uh, finished and there are more to come. The Lee's chapter, Ben Ramsey, who's one of our PhDs here, as well as being a lecturer at the University of Staffordshire, is looking at uh, Electronica Classic, Vortica's Foil, from their classic 1994 album. Ambrose Seddon, who's here in the audience today, has done a very interesting structural analysis of the time points, the way that uh, Andrew Lewis's Penland Point evolves in time, and uh, the key features of that work. John Ferguson from Kingston, <coughs> looking at uh, new instruments and improvisation. He's created uh, his own extended instrumental forms, and he's looking at the works of Kath Matthews, Michel Weisswitz, Christine Sinoi, who had made it a, one of uh, Weisswitz's only CD recordings was done at GRN in Paris, and uh, he's looking at that along with other works. Kirsten Glandine, how do you come to terms with a sound sculpture, a British uh, sound sculpture, sound sculptor working in Berlin, Douglas Henderson, uh, Fadenzonen, which is made of loudspeakers. It's a structure that includes loudspeakers in its structure, and it's driven by a sound system. She's trying to come to terms with how you look at this as a work of art in our field. Manuela Blackburn on cultural borrowing within uh, Diana Salazar's music and uh, general issues. Sophie Smith, who did a doctorate here, now a lecturer here, is looking at turntable, uh, turntablism, if you like, championship routine from a group called Kirik, and looking at how turntables interact in that particular form of, of electroacoustic culture. And in my own look, as I mentioned earlier, at Hans Tuchku's Cell and Linian, live electroacoustics, to which we have three additional chapters coming, not yet with, with us, but coming any minute, Pierre's is being discussed now. He's actually going to write up the experience of the analysis and the idea of developing a sound-based music analytical tool. I'm very happy to say Catherine Norman has agreed to do a soundscape for us. Uh, Claude Schreier's Vancouver Soundscape Revisited, she will be looking at again. And Andrew Hugill and Panos Emelides are looking at uh, Papa Sangre. And uh, Andrew said yesterday they're up to level 24. So um, <laughs> they've got a little bit more work to do on it, but um, uh, they've been working together, working through this particular audio and computer game, and coming to terms with how that is sort of structured in the imagination and uh, using some new ideas on that. So that's where we are with the book. We're very happy with it, and we hope that about one year from now, you will have a book and a website with, um, uh, with some music examples and stuff uh, to enhance the book. 
Um, I haven't got any conclusions. Uh, at the end of the day, I love your as a community's view on the kinds of things that people in academia and just people that love the music from anywhere, what kinds of things we can do to help the process of understanding, help the musical experience. To help the musical experience is important. Analysis is not dry, it has the function of communication in many different ways. Um, we're coming up to time. Lee said he wanted to add something at the end of this, but in fact, that is the conclusion of my talk, which isn't a conclusion. I'm going to hand over to Mike in a minute. But are there questions? And uh, Lee, you said you wanted to add something about the future. Well, uh, you just put future down there, and we're thinking about, uh, I don't, well, the project ends in September, as we all know, but uh, the funny thing about research projects is, is they, uh, you know, they're self-contained because there's a time limit. But like a good meal, uh, when you have a good meal, you'd like to uh, continue uh, and have something nice again. Maybe not the same, but uh, developing that recipe a bit further. So uh, we do not believe, the team, that this should end here. We have some ideas for the future, which include some of the things that Simon just mentioned, such as uh, computer assistance uh, in analysis, so expert systems or some scientific approaches dealing with the emotive experience, or as I said in the introduction, combining this initiative with other similar complementary initiatives, or things that we haven't thought of yet. Um, and you're all here because you're interested in this kind of thing. Um, and in a, in a period of collaboration, uh, exchanging thoughts and fantasies and visions for the future are most welcome. And both Simon and I very much hope that this will go on and flourish. Uh, one of the aspects that uh, uh, we would really like to look into is going back to that original four-part question and actually fleshing out for which users. What does that mean? What, for which intention? Ambrose came up with a very specific intention in his analysis that I might not have automatically come up with, but I found absolutely uh, uh, fantastic in terms of how to approach a composition like Andrew Lewis's. So there's more to develop there, and I think uh, we need even more case studies to, uh, to a, uh, or more analyses uh, through Orama, uh, through the book, uh, and taking this further, uh, because we still don't have ones that seem to be internationally rec recognized as, I wouldn't go so far as to say paradigmatic because I don't think it exists, but showing potential ways with potential tools, with the potential approaches, and so on and so forth. I think that is something we need to continue to do through the initiatives and through future funded projects, and that is all I was going to add. Thank you, Lee.